through the vision of the late, or through the vision of the late Robert Blatt, a California attorney with a huge heart who felt very deeply about the power of forgiveness. One reason Robert chose the first Sunday in August as International Forgiveness Day was because it coincided with the commemoration of a tragic event in history, and that is the atomic bombing of Hiroshima during World War II. To welcome you to this facility is Ralph Awana, president of the Pacific Islands Mission Center, Community of Christ Church. Ralph is also the dad of Kalani Kapu, who, who sounded the pool, who began our time uh, of gathering today. And so I'd like to honor uh, Ralph as he makes his way forward. Oh my God, cool. all of you. I'm very happy to welcome all of you to uh, Community of Christ here in Kalihi, or as we're also known as the Rose Church, or Rose Street Church here. But we welcome you and know and recognize that as we share together on this occasion that we uh, lift up each other and be uh, very appreciative of one another and also to recognize how important and of great value that we uh, continue to learn those different uh, skills and aspects of, of, forgive of forgiveness so that we can continue to help to bring healing to, our, to ourselves as well as to each other and to our community. So we are truly blessed that you are here and that we gather here today to, to celebrate and to recognize the importance of, of forgiveness and peace. I just wanted to share these uh, words that I, uh, I found, of course, in an article. And I was thinking, gee, where did I read this in the scripture and everything? Well, it's in the song that um, Queen Lily of Kalani uh, wrote. And, um, and it's the prayer that she had written when she was um, uh, held captive. And these, these are the words in Hawaiian. Mai na na ino ino na hewa ke kanaka. Aka ahui kala mahe mahe. Don't look at the sins of men, but forgive and be cleansed. May we continue to remember those words that we continue to move forward to be uh, forgiven and cleansed. We begin our Hawaii Forgiveness Hero Recognition today with Trish Ellis. A forgiveness hero is someone courageously and publicly showing us how forgiveness can transform lives. Susan Ford will introduce her, our first hero. Please welcome Susan Ford. I feel so honored to be asked to introduce Trish Ellis. It is with great peace love in my heart for her that I am here today. Well, I don't know what you'll be on. But let me stop from the heart. She's up there in the left corner. Oh, I see. Hi, Trish. Hi, Trish. <laughs> you see her smile? <laughs> her smile is genuine and it's so well heartwarming. So everyone who has met with her feels the connection. Whatever she says, it feels like she's talking to you. And that's one of her greatest gifts among this whole list of each year. So she was originally um, from um, New Mexico, but she has so she's originally from New Mexico, but she has called Hawaii Island as her home for 30 years. Her work with attitudinal healing spans over four decades in numerous capacities, 
It's in the global attitudinal healing community. And one thing I want to say that's not on my script about people who speak globally, it's not easy because there's so many different languages and so many different customs. But you know, Trish, with her smile, it doesn't matter. Everybody welcomes her and feels at home because I've learned it's like she's talking to you. A core, core component of her work and her life is forgiveness. A principle central to all attitudinal healing programs. She designed social, emotional, and leadership workshops for youth and adults. She has trained over a thousand facilitators. She has met with thousands and thousands of individuals from all over the world. And she has started and helped with developing an attitudinal healing program all around the world. Through Jerry Chapolsky, Trish met Paul Platt, the founder of the Worldwide Forgiveness Alliance. She participated in planning Forgiveness Institute, I mean, forgiveness events in the Bay Area of California in the 1990s. Later, she joined the White Forgiveness Project, which brought Dr. Luskin's forgiveness program to the island. Currently, she is the director of the Hawaii Attitudinal Healing Center. I'd like to welcome Thank you so much, Susan, and thank you to all of you at the Hawaii Forgiveness Project who make this event possible every year. Um, I feel so honored to uh, be within the membership of uh, so many people who I uh, love and admire and feel inspired by. And um, uh, like probably many of you, practicing forgiveness in my daily life has profoundly transformed my experience of life and my relationships over the years. And I'm so grateful to all of the people who um, have uh, guided me and inspired me to continue on the path of forgiveness. You know, of course, that group includes the, the visionaries and the um, pioneers of forgiveness, like Bob Platt, like Jerry Chapolsky, uh, Fred Leskin, and uh, uh, so many people who worked tirelessly over the years to bring forgiveness and the practice of forgiveness and the benefits of practicing forgiveness um, into the mainstream so that all of us, wherever we live, whatever path we're on, um, can learn to practice forgiveness in profound ways. Other people who have inspired me over the years are um, the heroes of forgiveness that have been honored uh, over the past 22 years here, um, who despite even severe abuse and suffering have chosen to forgive and have uh, shined a light on the path for the rest of us to follow. Um, and of course, my family and friends who have always uh, been role models for me in unconditional love and forgiveness. Uh, first of all and foremost in my own life is my daughter Jennifer, who has always been was always and still is, even though she's not the body anymore, but she, she still continues to be my greatest inspiration of forgiveness and unconditional love. And finally, I want to thank those people who have caused me harm in my life, because if it weren't for, for them, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to learn how to forgive and to use it in my life in so many ways that have, have benefited me over the years. So I invite you all to take a moment and think about the people in your life who have inspired you and um, 
brought you here today to think about forgiveness and practice forgiveness and experience the benefits of forgiveness in your own life. So thank you. I wish I could be there in person with you so I could get some hugs. <laughs> but I'm happy to uh, be with you online and am grateful for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Trish, for everything that you do, for everything that you uh, uh, kind of blazing that trail for everyone to follow. And so I just honor you. I thank you. And yes, that, that smile of yours is amazingly beautiful. So thank you. Thank you. Just that smile is like a hug. So thank you once again. And Trish, we have a poll for you here. As well as a book for Is Harmony? I can hear that. I'm sorry. We have a poll for you, and we have a whole fun fun book, which we will get to you very, very soon. So thank you so much. And it's so nice to see you again. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> And thank you once again, Susan. Uh, our second Hawaii Forgiveness Hero is the Epic Ohana Youth Partners, a truly transformative group of young folks. Uh, Lori Ariel Tochiki was the former executive director of Epic Ohana, and she had a vision for, for, this, for the young group, for a young group. And Karina Sosa and Charlene Takeno will now introduce the partners. So I'd like to welcome you forward. Please put your hands together. to work with Epic Ohana and their youth partners. Um, Laurie couldn't be here today. She's actually flying back from the mainland, but her vision was to have the youth peer program to, um, to hire young adults with lived experience or lived exper expertise to help other youth navigate through the system, such as child welfare, or juvenile justice, and CAMHD. The Kohana has been doing this since 2018. They started with a team of five, and now they're at 11 and still growing. So it's my pleasure to be able to work with them and introduce them today. And this is Karina Sosa, please, you peer supervise. Thank you, Charlene. Hi, everyone. Karina Sosa, Community Partner uh, Manager with Epic Ohana. And I have the honor and privilege to oversee this amazing program. I'm going to share some words on behalf of Lori um, and with a little bit of me sprinkled in there as well. <laughs> I am deeply honored for this recognition, particularly for our youth partners. All of our youth partners have lived experience in systems when they were children and teens and are now walking alongside me who are currently navigating those same systems through their work as peer supports. We often refer to our peer supports as lived experts. The wisdom and grace these young lived experts have and share with others is inspiring and healing. Epic's vision for youth peer support comes from the youth partners themselves. Together, they dream that there will be a youth partner for every young person in foster care and other systems, and that youth can have access to a youth partner at all levels of those systems. Our youth partners dream of a well-trained and well-supported youth Peer support workforce, they envision a program that encourages the youth they work with to have and pursue their dreams. Dreams of furthering education, financial dreams, and personal dreams. And EPIC envisions that one day our EPIC leadership will be a former youth partner. Thank you for your recognition of our work and these inspiring young people. And now we get to call uh, some of our youth partners forward so that we can honor them. Okay. 
So we have uh, Tiffany Ramos Stu, she's our youth partner lead. Andy Savanov, our youth partner uh, serving our youth experience homelessness. Desiree Daza, uh, youth partner lead. And Janine Davis, uh, youth partner. All here on the wall. Tiffany Ramos Du, and I'm a youth partner lead here on the Waffle. Um, what, what did you want to share? <laughs> um, I, I feel like this is great. Um, we, we actually got the opportunity to go to the Forgiveness Conference earlier this year, and it was very impactful for a lot of our young, for a lot of our youth partners, I think most of them. And um, so I, I think that this is just amazing work. Um, and it's very inspiring to hear from others who have gone through this journey, right? Um, and so thank you all. Um, and we, we look forward to continuing to help build that path for the young people. Um, you know, we, we hope to help change systems to where the youth that are going through them can, you know, see brighter futures for themselves. And, and have you. So, thank you. You <laughs> sure? <laughs> so, Mike gives you or is You guys are good? Yeah. Oh, Choose a ball. Choose a ball. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Susan, yeah. Okay, you go switch your Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Susan, sure. the boy you have is their boat. <laughs> this one is treacherous. So yeah, run it back over. <laughs> I'll switch with you. But who would receive that ball? Then, mm -hmm. okay. I didn't know I was going to come up to you. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can see you in a matter of time. Huh? Okay, so to the Epic Wild and Youth Partners, thank you for everything you do. Mahalo, mahalo, mahalo. Keep up the work, okay, guys? Thank you so much. So thank you once again for Epic Ohana. Continue doing what you're doing. Continue to be an inspiration for the youth out there. Um, really, you are the future to really teach and build and grow with, with forgiveness and to teach that to the world. So thank you, thank you, thank you for everything that you do. All right. Chuck Spetsam. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but, but I, like, I just like to say it, the Italian style Spetsam. <laughs> Chuck Spitzano is a 2012 Hawaii Forgiveness Hero. He and spouse Lenzi are co-founders of Psychology of Vision and live in Kaneohe uh, when they are not traveling around the world, sharing their knowledge and expertise. Please put your hands together and welcome Chuck to the stage. So, Welcome everyone. Um, how to squeeze everything I know into 10 minutes. <laughs> or as a friend of mine said, what am I gonna do with the other five? <clears throat> um, there's a, uh, in the Mekong Delta at the very end, there's a, uh, an island that is a Buddhist monastery. And the first thing that happens when you go to that monastery is the monks take you and they walk you down a path to the end of the island. And there, right next to the Mekong River, there's two 70-foot statues of Jesus and Buddha with their arms around each other. And teaching in Asia and Europe and North America, this has been a theme for me. So um, I'd like to start off with 
something that the Buddha said when he awoke from being seven years under the Bodhi tree. He said, it's all a dream. And I'm a dreamer. There's nothing in this world that's not part of my mind. Quantum physics took a long time to catch up with that, that this is an illusion. It's a dream. And that beyond it, well, what the Buddha found was a void. But beyond that is the light. So it's all been a dream. What, what's that about? So we dream everything that happened to us. You know, as I'm working people out of their worst pain, it's like this is one of the angles that really helps them. Um, I've been doing healing work for 53 years now, and so it's like one of the things that helps forgiveness is can you forgive enough to hear your calling, to hear what spirit wants you to do, to know your vocation. Um, in the Gospels, it says, uh, everyone is called, but do you remember the second part of that? Good. You answer my you answer who I told it. <laughs> that rings it up. Jesus said, everyone is called, but few choose to listen. And what you listen to is what's inside you, because that's where heaven is. I've been on enough airplanes to know it's not up in the clouds. It's within you. That's where oneness is. Jesus was the first one to become the Christ. He, he, he knew God. He reached oneness. He reached that pure love. So he's inside you. And Buddha reached oneness too afterwards. And he's inside you. And so is Kuan Yin. And so is Mother Mary. And so is all of them. So if you get frightened, you've forgotten who walks with you who's inside you because underneath the biggest problem that I've found in the world is self-attack anybody here not attack themselves hmm. yeah because I if, if there is I just have one thing to say to you show show off <laughs> <laughs> so some of the most creative people I know are people who just attack themselves daily in major ways. What I found working with catastrophic illness is that it's, among other things, it's a major self-attack. Any problem you have is a form of self-attack. And you can forgive yourself, but that's the toughest form of forgiveness. As your wife will sometimes tell you. you know? So it's like, what, there's, a, there's an easy way that I found back in the 80s. And that is that it's like whenever you have a problem, whenever you're feeling bad, whenever something is stopping you, there's somebody who needs your help more than you. And if you reach out to them, if you extend yourself, it pops that bow. There may be another layer that comes up. In 1983, I was teaching a 17-day workshop in the Five Lake District around Mount Fuji. And it was the morning of the last day. And in, in, in that kind of workshop, so much pain comes to the surface and so much grace comes in. And one of the fellows who had been tortured by his parents, I mean, physically tortured, he had 50 cent piece marks where there were cigarette burns. This is really pretty unheard of in Japan at this, 
this point. And there was a woman who was, there was half the women in the room were crying on the floor, they were in so much pain. And of course he had just popped open the newest level of torture that he was bringing out the repression to be healed. And he, he, you know, everybody was crying so hard. My best friend was having a heart attack in the back of the room. It was like running a circus. And I watched him, you know, be in his pain. He opened his eyes. He saw this woman suffering so much. And I watched him crawl across the room until he could take her in his arms. And then they were crying tears of comfort, of consolation, of sanctuary. And you have that inside you. The desire to extend yourself because it's built in. It's how we were created. We, we want to help people. I, I think I said this in 2012. One day I was praying on the way to my office and I was going, what could help the world? And I heard the voice. And it was one of the times I heard the voice, and the voice said, it answered me, what about the world? said, an idea. And when you hear the voice, you either change your underwear or you listen closely. I chose to listen closely. And I said, well, what idea could, could help? And it said, an idea that everyone could get behind. And I said, what idea could everybody in the world Get behind. And the words were very clear. By this time I was sitting at my desk. It said, friends helping friends. And so it, it's inspiring to hear the youth going, yeah, I can help. I can make a difference. You don't have to know what to do or to say, but you show up and that's all that's needed. If there's anything to do or to say, you'll be inspired. You'll get that inkling, you'll get that sense, this is what I do. So, friends helping friends. What would you do for your friends? What would you do? Some of them are closer than your family. So, my wife has been a major inspiration for me over the years. She's brought the feminine part of this. She started the Hugs program when I started here for children with life-threatening illnesses. And that's where I met her and lured her away to do this work. So since then, we became the flying spazanos going around the world teaching and bringing our, our kids. Now they're grown up. Now they take us places. So, my son, Christopher. suggested that with my son and my daughter that we write a book called How to Raise Your Parents. <laughs> but they politely decline and understand why. Because you know, it's a work in progress. So here we are um, in the 70s when I started this work. One of the first things that came up to be forgiven was things passed down through ancestors. What I quickly found was because I was working with the U.S. Navy and there were so many drug problems and, and tr war traumas and stuff like this, it's like I found a way to get into the subconscious. So I studied hypnosis. Look into my eyes. <laughs> and um, but gradually, I found a quicker way, because if you know me, you know I'm basically a lazy guy, so I, I found a quicker way to get into the subconscious and the unconscious. So by 1975, I was doing work with people in the womb. Um, if you had a trauma when you were a child, like say three years old, then at three months old in the womb, you had trauma also. You had trauma at birth, you had trauma at conception, because you're just, a, you're a psychic sponge, you're absorbing it all. 
So that's a lot to forgive, just, just on that interpersonal level. If you want to see the program that you brought in to heal your past lives, look at how your life was through 10 years old. Because the things that haven't been finished will show up in your childhood. Now, the good news is you can heal ancestral patterns and you can heal past lives as easy as you can heal anything. If you're willing to change, if you're willing to learn, it's if you take it down from the subconscious mind, which is everything since conception, down to the unconscious mind, everything you see is a mirror of you. That's what Buddha said. It's my mind that makes the world. And so you could forgive anything or anyone and it will be forgiving you. In, in 1981, I was teaching a workshop. I was going from Orange County to uh, Long Beach to teach a series of evening, evening workshops. And it was a parking lot on the freeway. And I had to get to this place to be on time and begin the workshop. So I had this thought, what if I forgave the traffic? You've never had any cause to forgive traffic, have you? So uh, I forgive you. You know, just stand it up. To Anyhow, I forgave the traffic. Within five minutes, it cleared up. <laughs> I was like, wow, this is really cool. I really like this forgiveness thing. So the next week, evening, same thing, parking lot. So I forgave the traffic. Nothing changed except I went into this deep state of peace. It didn't matter that I was 20 minutes late. We took 20 extra minutes and it was just a profound evening workshop. The Tao, Holy Spirit, is unfolding your life so that you will face the things you've hidden away and you will see it in the people around you. You will feel it inside you. You will face challenges. And the purpose of this and I, I found this in a quote from Yogananda, that the purpose of it all is to heal and learn and grow as much as we can so that we, at the end of our lives, we can come back in our next life at a higher level of awareness and love and extending ourselves to others. Because if you're attacking yourself, you won't think about reaching out to someone. The, the, the form of, of, of a miracle is simple. You extend your love and you extend God's love. And that's all he is. And you get up if you believe the people who have reached oneness, who are enlightened and self-realized, the second stage of enlightenment, then it's, you realize at some stage that you're God. Imagine that, how much power would you have? How much love would you have? You would just melt away just loving everybody and everything. This is what we've come for, to know ourselves. Because then you'll know that you are everyone and you're everything. You now, beyond this world, it's our dream, it's our projection. There, there's a deeper world, and it's a world of light. It's a world of love. Quantum physics says it's, it's all light until we put something there, echoing the Buddha. That's our dream. Your parents are the biggest parts of your soul. Your siblings, your partners, your children are the biggest parts of your soul that you have brought in. Let me give you a really quick healing method that I 
use uh, choosing your mother Mary or Kuan Yin. And imagine a time in your life where it was very painful when you were growing up. And ask Mother Mary, Kuan Yin, they're in oneness. Sometimes they switch masks throughout, show up and enjoy things in the West or the East. Ask them to bring in Holy Family body into your family. So it becomes all for one and one for all. Then you become a team again, all going in the same direction for that kind of love and success that makes a family precious and transformational. I see a lot of us here who uh, reach the white hair stage, the gray hair stage. And um, what I know is that every teacher, what they look for and hope for, but they don't expect it, is to find someone coming after them who is so pure, who is so inspired who is following in their footsteps, someone that they could pass the torch on to. Like as the kahunas passed, they would have their closest student there to catch their last breath, to carry on everything that they had achieved and to build on it. So it's inspiring to see us gray hairs passing this on to, to young people, to young people who are heartfelt, to young people who are visionaries, to one way to have people who want to find the way, not only for themselves, but for each other. So I think I've said it. So for the last 53 years, it's, it's been an adventure, it's been an inspiration to find a way, to find new ways. And it, if I don't find something new every six months, it, you know, things get stale for me, so I pray for that. And one of the last things that I've been doing is building a map of consciousness back to heaven, back to oneness, the stages we go through, the traps in each stage. So if someone talks to me for about 10 minutes with the intent of healing, I can find out where they are, what the issue, what the major issues are. Of course, we're all unique in how we you know, get self-destructive. Because imagine every heinous thing that has ever been done, we've done it. That's what I found working with people in the unconscious. And there's ways through that. <clears throat> and it's not that difficult. If you want to find a way through, you can heal that because it, we, we are as God created us. He created us like himself. He didn't make separate bodies. We're all light. We're all love. We're all oneness. We just need to remember that. And if we remember that for any length of time, we're there. So that's where we're heading. And on the way, we meet our brothers and sisters. We meet our friends. You meet others walking along the same path, arm in arm, with confidence. We're, we're in really crucial time. Uh, how many of you have heard the saying, may you live, supposedly an ancient Chinese curse, may you live in, in, in interesting times? How many have heard that? <clears throat> None of my friends in China have ever heard that. <laughs> no way. No way. So, but we are living in interesting times, and no matter how things turn out, it's a chance for us to leap forward in consciousness, for us to pull vault over the obstacle, for us to find a way to forgive, and to join with everybody, because it's all us. There's no one in this world who isn't like you used to be. You know, so many times when I find people who 
I just, they, they can't, I can't forgive my mother. I just can't. Or do you know what that perpetrator did to me? Yeah, well, here's one way. This is one of many ways. I take them back and have them gaze at all their past lifetimes and ask them this question. How many times were you just like this? Wouldn't that make things easier? How many times were you just like your wife? Hmm. How many times were you just like your parents? And then to take them through understanding acceptance, compassion, forgiveness, and then from their lifetimes, bring it back to that person they can't forgive. And in not one instance have they failed to forgive that person because they understood that was me. All forgiveness is, is for, for us. When we forgive, we forgive ourselves. So we, we live in a most magnificent place, a most beautiful place. When I grew up on the East Coast, I kept hearing this call for Hawaii, for Hawaii. It took me a while to get here, but I got here. And I've been here for 40 years. And I never felt like I was home until I got back to Hawaii. So let's be home. Paul Thoreau said, Hawaii is not a state of mind. It's a state of grace. And we've been gifted with that. Let us spread it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chuck, for sharing your words. I'm reminded of uh, Urban Johnny Coleman who was uh, the first black woman to, to uh, be ordained through the Unity Church. And one of her powerful words was to remind us that we are co-creators. And so she said, uh, I am the thinker who thinks the thoughts which become the things that can transform lives. I am the thinker who becomes, I am the thinker who thinks the thoughts which become the things that can change the world. So whatever you want to add to that end of that line, you add to that end of the line. We are co-creators with the divine to bring about peace, to bring about a world of forgiveness, to bring about this love that we all dream about. And it's, it's, it's only a dream if we don't act upon it. And that is for us. So thank you for acting upon it, Chuck. Thank you for doing your work and sharing that love with the world and bringing that understanding to the world as well. Please put your hands together one more time for Chuck. Aaron David Mahi is our third Hawaii Forgiveness Hero. Uh, the introduction here is quite short, and Aaron is an immensity. He's a, he's a force of nature uh, within the Hawaiian community, and his contributions have been just profound. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna invite up Merton Chinen to, to present what we have for Aaron. We uh, have a small switch in our program, so Amy is going to do a hula, and um, she was going to do it afterwards, but um, we thought that she would be appropriate to she do it now. Okay, so Amy, you go over. I've been blessed with so many things. God's been good to me. I have family and friends to share in all that I.
interesting, many-faceted person, and he was 70 years old, right? And he was going to be 71 years old later, but um, he packed a whole lot of things within that 70 years that he lived. And um, today I'm going to just share with you just a little bit about his life and many, many aspects of his church life. That was so important to me, who he was. And he was very active in the community. Um, he had many musical talents, his Hawaiian history and his language, his cooking. He prepared a full-on luau to a simple stew and rice dinner. And all these activities, he was so open in sharing with others. And he really loved engaging and bringing to other people. Um, with many of his activities, he still found time to strengthen his spiritual life in the community of Christ, which was a very important part of Aaron's life. And he was blessed by his grandfather, Henry Mahi, baptized by his dad, Miguel Mahi, confirmed by his grandfather, Henry, again, and his father. And he served as a deacon, priest, and elder in the priesthood as a 17, a special witness for Jesus Christ. He was also pastor of the Community of Christ Church in Makiki for many years, 
and he came full circle when his grandfather and his uncle Donald also served as pastors. And Aaron was always eager to share the love of Christ, especially through his giftedness in music and cooking. You know, at Community of Christ, um, we had the Forgiveness Day last year called Kahi and Why Not? And um, we, we have a camp there every June. Um, and, and I was going to be involved in leading a campfire. But she was also <coughs> playing the piano and the bass, or leading a congregation and singing. He was also so good with food, you know, with the emu, the pig, mixing lonely salmon and preparing other Hawaiian dishes for Lua or Hawaiian great sale. And he, he was a strong Christian that did many things that blessed so many thousands of people over his life. And this is for for you, that for those of you who know that uh, we are trying to impact the system of care, but Aaron was involved in helping to um, even do that, and he served. Um, I remember when we did the first foster care banquet for the youth at Makiki Church. He was there cooking, and even in Washington Place at the governor's residence, he did the cooking there. So he was really trying to help. And he also hosted our Forgiveness Day event, which um, Brian Kelly Souza is he has so graceful and he's done this and he's done a terrific job. And you know, I was in contact with Aaron that he was gonna be doing this year's event as well, but of course um, God took him home. And he also was very a student, as he was trying to translate the Hawaiian Bible, the Hawaiian Bible, and he had studied Hebrews. So Aaron felt very connected to people, and he was connected with his God. And he would often bless an office or home, preside at a wedding, at a wedding or funeral service, and he sat down with people to to find healing and reconciliation. Reconciliation, and he shared his aloha with many. He was not a perfect man; none of us are. But he really saw the value in forgiveness that our Queen did, and we have so much for aloha for Aaron, and we know Aaron has aloha for us. So I'd like to introduce Ralph Arona, who many of you um, know already, and he's married to Aaron's cousin, Tonya, and the father of Kani Papu. Welcome, except for Aaron. Thank you. Thank you on uh, behalf of Aaron's uh, family very much for this uh, time, this opportunity. And you know, I just wanted to, uh, uh, Aaron was a, always a good friend to all of us. And he uh, took care of us and fed us, and nurtured us in so many uh, different ways. And so we're, um, we're saddened that he's no longer physically with us, but we know and recognize how much uh, he has contributed to the community, to his family, to the church in so many ways and everything. And so I, I always remember us when we, that's Stephen Merton, when we went, we would go hiking a lot when we were younger. Probably can't do it anymore. But um, we hiked in all these different places and we uh, learned and, uh, about Hawaii and the beauty that these islands uh, you know, had and how much uh, we become, we became much more appreciative of this place. And so I remember we went to Kalalao Valley on the island of Kauai 
beautiful place. We went there. And this was our first um, our first hike that we were going on. And so we are all prepared and we were told what to bring and how to pack our our um, our bags or I don't know how our backpacks and everything. Um, but Aaron, when he came, he came with Spam, with Vienna sausage, he had rice and and he had all this food and everything. So we all said, well, we know who we're going to be with when it came time for us to eat. And, you know, and Aaron just, he just loved all those things. And he said, well, we got to eat in there. We cannot just eat. Because they only gave us dry food and everything. And he looked at that and he said, oh, we're not going to survive. And then, so he brought all this. And so then we all began to share the load. And we put some of the food that he brought into uh, our bags and then of course we had a big meal and, and we ended up in the first night eating all of it because it was just too heavy <laughs> but you know that's how Aaron was everywhere we we went he made sure that we were fed and that we had enough to eat and enough to share with one another and and I think you know for for him that was a very important part but also for Aaron he had a lot of challenges that came um, to his health um, and then uh, his own relationship in his marriage became very difficult. Um, even the situation at the Royal Hawaiian Band when he was, he was said, I mean he was told he, his position would remain and then later um, the mayor decided to give it to someone else. But that, those caused a lot of uh, struggles within Aaron. And, and he would talk about it, and then we would share with one another. And at the end, he says, you know, I have to kind of let it go. You know, it's not for me to hold on to and everything. And I think that's really the lesson we all have to um, carry on. And, you know, sometimes things do happen in our lives, but we, we find that there is hope, there is joy when we... Um, we forgive and we let go and we find peace. And I believe Aaron, you know, um, found peace. And even to the day before he died, I mean, you know, everything the doctor told him not to do, he did. Um, and he was at a sushi bar and after he, it was done with chemo and he said, you know, I, I'm just all over for sushi. And so he went to the sushi bar to him and I said, oh, I don't think that's a great idea. But, I mean, that was him, you know, he's going to enjoy but, and enjoy the people that he's, he's with and everything. So I'm very thankful and grateful. And you know, the line that I shared with you earlier, you know, let the sins of men, uh, I forgot, but that's part of the, the uh, Queen's Prayer, but so be forgiven and cleanse. You know, be forgiven. My my to clean and everything, and so that was Aaron's really his mantra, I guess, is you know, be forgiven and cleanse. And so I pray that we all, in our own lives, and as we go on, that we carry on that that um, um, what Aaron has has guided us to to look at is you know let the let the sins of these men go forth, but let us always forgive and be cleansed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Merit uh, is our final forgiveness hero, and we're that we're honoring today, and he will be introduced by Michael. So at every forgiveness day, Merritt would be outside. He would be guiding traffic into the parking lot. I remember there was one time when we had the event at Waihao Church. 
he wore the fluorescent jacket because it's right near downtown there, right? People whizzed by on Capulani. So Merrick was prepared for everything. And he had a fine mind and a great heart and very humble. Merrick would never highlight himself. He'd be embarrassed to hear me talking about him this way. Merrick supported everybody else to be great. Now, 1946 in Honolulu. Picture that time when Merrick came into this world. He was always a seeker of wisdom, and he was an architect. He had that kind of incisive mind. And he studied in Oklahoma and Washington State, and he was a conscientious objector during the Vietnam War. So he served during the Vietnam War. But he served in community development rather than in combat. And as long as the heart was true, the service was clear. He loved America and everything that we stand for. Something really outstanding about merit was all those of Japanese ancestry who were survivors of the nuclear explosions in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He kept track of them. He knew who they were. He honored them. He respected them. You know, there was a time not long ago when a great many people in our community here were from that lineage. And a great many people here were also those who had been taken to the camps and imprisoned either locally or on the mainland. And he didn't judge, he didn't have a political view of those things, but he wanted to support them to, certain, to do more than survive, to come through and to realize the essential mobility of their soul, their life, their culture, their country, so that ultimately the experience of being Japanese in the middle part of this past century, which was very difficult, Ultimately, through the work of Merit Sakata and many others, many of those wounds have been healed. He was very devoted to his church, Seicho Noye. He was always there, and Merit would always say, if you want to come, I'll interview you. I have some questions. His, the, the name of his, of his video series that he had for years was, Now That You Ask Me. And then he would fill in the blank for an hour and talk about it. We have all of those videos. We have hundreds of hours of videos. And he interviewed people that a lot of times they didn't want to be interviewed, like, like Sister Joan, for example. We have classic interview and meeting. Sister Joan Chatfield, and many others. So Merritt's legacy will live on in those footsteps, in those sounds, in those words, in those hearts of the many people he helped. And I was very proud and very humbled to be part of it. Kim, you were part of our crew, right? You remember Merritt. He'd, he'd be outside saying, oh, this program is taking a little too long now. I think it means. <laughs> no. Let us thank Merit and all the other unseen servants all around us, all the men and women, all the angels that are with us all the time, unseen and unknown, undeclared, and yet so vital to our life and our work in this world. Merit's Lifetime wife, Carol, is here with us. Carol, will you come so that we can present a little token of our respect? Now, Carol is a genius architect, recognized as one of the top architects in Hawaii and nationally, and stood alongside Merritt and supported him in everything, and he supported you in everything. 
Uh, so good to see you. Yeah. Michael is right. Merritt will be embarrassed and say that he wasn't worthy of this honor, which is exactly what I told. I think Michael and Roger have been virtual when they first approached me about this. But thank you very much. Um, we're still trying to get some of the videos of his series that he shot edited. Uh, right now they're locked in a computer that has a password we haven't figured out yet. <laughs> but we have someone who will be editing them so that we'll all can share a few more hours of his programs. And he was you know, still recruiting people up till the end. His oncology doctors and an oncology nurse was a good friend of his. He had them kind of tentatively lined up to do a program, but he just didn't live quite long enough to shoot that one. So thank you very much for this great honor. I know that he spent many, many years um, active in this organization and, and other interfaith and peace He was trying to recruit me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he probably would be on all of the emails. <laughs> yeah. You know, I knew Mary only for that short time. Uh, from that event that I, I happened to be a keynote speaker at, uh, with you folks, Susan. And, and from then, we had been in conversation uh, via text and, and messages and whatnot. Um, but he was also trying to get me to be on the video uh, or be interviewed as well. And I, I was open for that opportunity. I was waiting for that opportunity. And, I'm just thankful that I got to, to meet him. And uh, so he definitely had an effect. In fact, the day, uh, in the days towards the end, I was with Kumu Ramsey, and he had called Kumu Ramsey as we were doing an event, and uh, he just asked Kumu Ramsey to, to keep him in prayer. And so I was with, with Kumu at that time, and I got to also speak with him. Um, but what a beautiful human being he, he was. So, so thank you so much for sharing him with all of us. Uh, we're going to have Roger Epstein come up and share uh, all of the exciting details of his recent, recent trip to Bhutan. Uh, Roger is an attorney with lots of thoughts and ideas on, on bringing forgiveness, bringing aloha, just, just making this world a better place. So please put your hands together for Roger Epstein. Aloha, aloha. 22 years, wow, it's been a long time. I'm going to take you a little history before I get to Bhutan and what we're doing now. Uh, 1995, I was a trustee at the Queen's Hospital, and Robin Moore called, and she said there's this incredible couple in town, Jerry Jampolsky and his wife, Diane Sorincioni, and they want to do work in the Pacific, and you need to go talk to them and make them do it in Hawaii. So I got to Queens Hospital to uh, uh, put Jerry on a program, and he stayed. And uh, they did wonderful work here, as many of you know. And in 2003, Jerry was the inspiration and the founder for the Hawaii Forgiveness Project. And he passed out his book on forgiveness. And Michael Broderick uh, was the host of the uh, uh, Hawaii Forgiveness Project. And then he became a judge. And then he said, well, who will pick this up? And somehow it fell on me in 2004. And we held monthly meetings at my office when I was uh, with a large law firm. And then when I retired, we had it at the synagogue. And the forgiveness turned into two things, really. And I, I get this from Auntie Michaelani Henry, 
who's a wonderful who, who went on to the island. She said, you can have all the trauma and drama you want in your life, but if you want to have a good life, a Pono life, you need to do two things, forgive and be grateful. And I like that a lot because forgiveness takes you out of the past, as we've been talking about. You just let go. Uh, there was a minister down at Unity Church had a nice thing about Okay, we're angry, we're mad at each other, and you pull them on a rope, and each one has the other rope. You want to forgive? Just drop the rope. It's a really nice metaphor. And so, forgiveness gets you out of the past, gratitude gets you out of the future, because you're satisfied with what you have now. And by getting out of the past and the future, you can be as fully present as possible in the only moment you ever do anything that any of us ever done anything in the now. So uh, we've had incredible people come in here. We had monthly meetings, as I said, up through COVID. And then we have, we've been able to continue this annual Hawaii International Forgiveness Day. We did stop the monthly meetings, but we had people come in and forgive their father for murdering their mother. Some of you may remember eight or 10 years ago, there was a horrific murder over in Eva Beach. A woman was sitting at a bus stop and somebody who had been let out of Kaneohe stabbed her 20 times. And uh, a few years later, her husband came and gave him a, a Hero of Forgiveness Award like we're doing today. And he said they had just adopted several kids from China. And he said when he heard the news, he fell on the floor and he just said, I can't go on. But he managed to let go. He managed to let go of his anger and forgive because he didn't want his kids to grow up being angry about somebody murdering his mother. So forgiveness and gratitude are two beautiful things that we need. And in 2019, I went to Bhutan. I had a friend and a client who was doing a lot of projects there, and she asked me to come as her lawyer and to help her uh, work through some contracts with the government on these projects. Now, Bhutan is a tiny landmark country surrounded by China and India. It's right next to Nepal. And uh, they began to see in the, in the 70s and 80s, they began to see that uh, the world was encroaching on them. They were gonna you know, become uh, not so much a third world country. And they had a very young king. The king had died in 72 and the new king was 17 years old. So 10 years later, he began to look around and say, look, uh, I want our country to be a good place. We're growing into the world. What do I do? So he went all over the world. And you know what he found? He went to many countries. He saw a lot of material wealth and a lot of unhappiness. And he said, you know, that's not what we want. We want to be happy. How do we do that? And so he decided, still a young man, he decided, look, you get what you pay attention to, what you focus on. We are all, we, we just heard Chuck talk about how we're connected to God. And we can, it's true. And the synchronicities in your life and the things you see as you get older, you realize how much you create just by your acceptance and your thoughts and your intentions. So he said, not only do you get what you focus on, but you focus on what you measure. And so if you measure GDP, you get a lot of product. So he said, why don't we measure gross national happiness? Then, if that's our focus, that's where we want to be. So the thing I really like about what the Bhutanese have done, and I'll, I'll elaborate on this a little bit, uh, is to organize our thoughts. I was talking with Ellen Brown just before we were here, and she was talking about merits group, Soichi Noe, and how they, they have programs 
to say, let's be happy. And they have laughter uh, exercise. And, but what does happiness really mean? What are we talking about? And here we have aloha, which is beautiful. But what does it mean on a practical level? So here's a, a, a way I like to explain it. Uh, in, in, in the Greek language, in ancient Greek language, they had two words for happiness. The first word was hedonia. Some of you may have heard of the hedonists. If you ever read Julius Caesar in uh, junior high school, Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, you'll know that the hedonists were people who wanted pleasure. That's what they thought life was about. And it is nice to have pleasure. Nobody's uh, uh, saying we shouldn't have a good meal. We shouldn't have a good laugh. We shouldn't have a good dance. We shouldn't have all the wonderful things that life has to offer. But of course, pleasures don't last long. And if you overdo it, you become addicted to it. So that's not what, what they mean by happiness. The other word in Greek was eudaimonia. Eudaimonia. You means beautiful. And daimon, D-A-I-M-O-N, means a deity or your higher self. So what the, what the Bhutanese mean and what we are really striving for is to really recognize the beauty in and be our best selves. That's what it's about. Um, and lots of ways to do that, lots of things. We, we, we really know this from every religion, from every culture, that to be a good person is to be of service, to find your true talents and experience those. Uh, we get so much pleasure out of helping other people. So I went there in 2019, and then I began to think, okay, forgiveness and gratitude are pillars. They're the means. They're the foundation of how we get to the present. But what's the real purpose? Purpose is to be happy. And, and when you think about it, uh, as I said, happiness can sound frivolous, but that's not what we're talking about. And when you think about uh, uh, why we, our country, revolted against Britain, one of the reasons was the pursuit of happiness, one of three reasons. So it's fundamental. And if you ask anyone, what do you really want in life? I want to be happy. So I, uh, in 2013, I started thinking, look, why don't we revise the Hawaii Forgiveness Project and turn it into a, a merging of gross national happiness in Bhutan and Aloha in Hawaii. So I feel, and I'm sure most of us in this room feel, that Hawaii is the strongest, the finest multicultural, ethnic, multi-ethnic uh, civil society in the world today. And we're such a small community, everybody just two, uh, uh, if I talk to anybody in this room and we go two degrees of separation, we know everybody on the walk over. And, and, and we have this love of Aloha. We have this belief. But how are we implementing it? And we're still caught up in the kinds of issues that uh, uh, we have everywhere. You know, the, the, uh, the, the greed. Uh, the the uh, school systems are still hundreds of years back in the dark ages where uh, we take people to school so that they'll learn how to be the factory, they'll have enough knowledge to be factory workers. And, and it's actually from the Prussian system where uh, they wanted to train people so they wouldn't rebel, they wouldn't have enough independent thought to rebel against the government instead of being creative. And, and so, uh, I thought, why don't we morph this into the, the from, from forgiveness to the Aloha Happiness Project, and why don't we take uh, the, what they're doing in Bhutan and utilize that to really try to make a practical implementation of living from Aloha here. Uh, uh, 
blending these two concepts. So, uh, so again, I went to Bhutan. Uh, uh, I started this uh, October 23rd. We had our first Aloha Happiness meeting. Uh, we have thousands of people that have come here uh, uh, to, to our monthly meetings over the years for the Hawaii Forgiveness Project. And uh, uh, so we had a, a number of people uh, come to the meeting to talk about it. We tried again. I can see that we're not ready for a monthly meeting. But I went back because we had gotten this started. I went to Bhutan, went to a conference on happiness in education. And the, uh, so they had a five day conference on happiness of 250 people there uh, from 25 different countries. Five day conference, and then three days to figure out where do we go from here after the conference. One of the fascinating things there's a school that's immersed in gross national happiness. And the title, if I had it up on the screen, you could see the school. It says education for lifelong citizenship. Now think about that. Educate, wouldn't it be terrific if we educated our citizens, our, you know, starting at age four or five, to do lifelong citizenship? And so uh, they teach the kids, one of the main things they start with is mindfulness. And uh, when we went to the school to look at the kids, uh, a couple of young boys took us around to the classrooms and they said, you know, before we do anything, we either do a sitting meditation or a walking meditation. So we said, what do you like best? They said, oh, we like the walking better. And I said, why? He said, it's too hard to sit. I said, how long do you sit? He said, one minute. And then I thought, I think at age 12, I couldn't sit still for a minute either. Anyway, so Dr. Uh, in 2012, the Bhutanese hired a guy named Dr. To. He's a uh, French Vietnamese uh, a person who created a whole organizational system of gross national happiness. He wrote this book, it's called A Culture of Happiness how to scale up happiness from people to organizations. His most recent book that just came out, was just given to us at the, at the education conference, is called Happy Organizations. And he's got a number of organizations that have adopted these principles. So what we're doing with the Loa Happiness Project is we, uh, we have a, a, an, an education group. I took to Bhutan a woman uh, who uh, is the vice chairman of the Charter School Commission here and also a senior executive at MIDPAC with the idea that uh, MIDPAC and the, uh, uh, the uh, Charter School Commission would be interested in developing a curriculum for Hawaii schools, of course, blended with our own culture. And uh, we're kind of working on that. In fact, I have a meeting with uh, one of the charter schools next week to, uh, and and uh, Shannon clearly came with me to talk about how we do that. Uh, secondly, we have a business committee that uh, uh, is taking these principles, and so far we have a, a startup that we're working with on that. And uh, I'm hoping that we'll grow that into something. There's something called the Executive Council of, of Corporations here and uh, talk to the top 50 companies here to see if any of them would be interested in how to do this. And, and again, these aren't principles that are unique. These are principles we all know, how to be a good person, how to, if you're with a company, how to take care of your employees, how to take care of the community, how to take care of the environment. In fact, those are the three principal areas that you work on. And if you wanna be happy, you gotta start with yourself. So you work on self-care, societal care, and world care, environmental care. So, uh, and then, so, so education, business, and we also have some groups that are just personal groups. And I encourage anybody who's interested, want to start a personal group, uh, get a copy of the book and 
it's really uh, well focused on, on uh, first of all, a survey of how are we doing? So they, they, I have some papers over there. Uh, they take nine domains of gross national act of, of, your, of your life. Your psychological well-being, your health, your time use, education, cultural diversity, community vitality, governance, ecological diversity, and living standards. So look at those and essentially do a psychological test in each of those areas, 10 questions. How do you feel about your psychological well-being? How do you feel about your health? So you got a country like Bhutan, they have 750,000 people. They take 1% do these surveys in, in various areas to try to get a baseline. How are we doing? And then next year, how do we make out? And what areas do we need to improve on? So that's the first thing that I think is really organized. Not only the idea of what is happiness and what are we shooting for to be our highest self and to teach kids to be lifelong citizens, what is it, where, what make, where are we? So, uh, so uh, the other group is a personal group. We have a couple of those four people that are trying to do uh, just within their community. Hey, let's get our friends together. Let's see how we're doing. Let's use the techniques that we're uh, in this book to try to really make our life a lot more meaningful as I said, live from our highest self. The third thing I want to talk about, besides the history of forgiveness and this new Hawaii uh, uh, of happiness, is a forgiveness project that came out quite synchronicity, synchronistically to me on my way to Bhutan. I got there, I had actually uh, been in Washington, D.C., and we had gone to the Holocaust Museum. and. Uh, my, my lovely significant other here and I, they had to throw us out of the museum because we got so engrossed with the horrors of World War II. I then came home and I went, uh, had dinner in San Diego. I was, I was in DC on my way back here. I stopped with a guy named Azim Kamisa, who has this incredible forgiveness story. His son was murdered at 17 by a 14 year old trying to get into a gang that was his initiation to shoot Azim's son who fell back in his car and drowned in his own blood. And for the last 35 years, Azim has talked to 2 million kids about nonviolence and forgiveness. So he just created an organization called Peace Through Forgiveness. And we talked at length about that, and now it's quite involved with actually the same organization, My Trade Institute, that runs the Hawaii Forgiveness Project, is now supporting his work, Peace Through Forgiveness. Okay, next piece, I'm on my way to Bhutan, and I'm sitting with uh, Shannon, who came with me, and she's been talking to these people behind me who are from Germany. And she says to uh, uh, Roger, the, the, the German one said, Roger, what are you, you know, what are you about? So I naturally, because we're at a happiness conference, I said, oh, I'm a corporate tax lawyer. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> and so I started talking about forgiveness. And she says immediately, Germans need forgiveness. She said, in Germany, people have so much shame and guilt that they're still carrying it now to the, to the negative and the detriment of the people. And it just so happens, my last synchronicity, I was born on the day, not anniversary, the day that Germany surrendered in World War II, 80 years ago. And on May 8th next year, it'll be the 80th anniversary of uh, Germany's surrender, and they still can't forgive themselves. And they've done reparations, they've apologized, they've been model citizens of a democracy in the world, Germany, for 80 years, but people are still carrying it around. And it shows you what we were talking about here, how hard it is to let go sometimes. We talked about Aaron and what a beautiful man, but he still, it's hard for him to let go of the things that happened to him. So 
what do you do? I, I went to the uh, San Francisco Art Museum, uh, Modern Art, some years ago. Uh, they did reopen. On the fifth floor, they had German art from the 50s. It was the bleakest, most hopeless works you've ever seen. Where do you go after your, your parents and your uh, brothers and sisters, you know, were, were murdering people in this horrific fashion? Well, what do you do with it? How do you, okay. So it's 80 years later now. When do we let go of this stuff? I said the other day, I, I've forgiven Attila Bahan. He doesn't upset me anymore. Uh, I'm sure he did worse things than Hitler. But the point is, uh, uh, in the Jewish religion, every year, the highest holiday is called the Day of Atonement. You get at one with God, and you go to the synagogue, and you pound yourself on the chest, and you say, I murdered, I stole, I, I, I lied. You take responsibility, not only for yourself, but the whole community, and then you ask for God's forgiveness. And in the liturgy, it says God is uh, just, which means you do the wrong thing, you, you get pointed out, and merciful. And in the long run, God is merciful, because if he wasn't, we'd all just have to throw it in the towel. So, uh, so, long story short, Chuck Spazano has been going to Germany for uh, 40 years now, doing his healing work there. And Chuck has agreed to take a primary responsibility in a program that I ended up, I, I mentioned Azim Kamisa, he started this program, he, on June 23rd, he had a, a, a big meeting to start off his Peace Through Forgiveness program. And uh, he had over 50 people there uh, online and who are all part of forgiveness organizations. And so I introduced this program that, that we want to do now, How Do the Germans Forgive Themselves? And we have a number of allies uh, uh, all over the world, literally, who are interested in doing this. But we need somebody in Germany, and Chuck's work there is just perfect for this. And his staff has agreed to take a, a leading role. What we're going to do on September 21st, we're going to make an announcement about German self-forgiveness. And then May 8th and 9th, uh, we're going to have a conference in Germany and broadcast it wherever we can and really help people forgive. And one other thing, forgiveness for the Germans is not just about them. We've just been talking about how we're all connected to the same energy. When you have people who have this negative guilt and shame that they're carrying around, it impacts all of us. So we're doing this for, for everybody, and I have my own personal, you know, I said I was born the day the war ended, and who was talking about Chuck, I think, about being in, in utero. I mean, I was in utero the last nine months of the war in an American Jewish neighborhood in Washington, D.C. You can imagine how people talked about the Germans the first five years of my life, and how much I got in there. So, I feel like other people can heal from this too. I don't want to tell myself or fellow Jews or fellow Americans or anybody they need to forgive the Germans, but I know I need to forgive the Germans myself. So before I end, I'd like to have Chuck come up. He's got a short few minute exercise on forgiving your ancestors. Uh, we are gonna go through Chuck. Can we do that? Do you want to come on up? Thank you. The biggest thing is that in the face of some problems that we've had, some problems in our family, some problems that we saw, this didn't start here. This, my parents have this, my grandparents have this, probably goes all the way back. So there, there's some easy ways, there's quick ways, and there's some longer ways. Let's, let's do one of the quick ones, okay? Uh, maybe we'll do one for your mother's side of the family and one for your father's side of the family. Now, look at your mom, look at your mother's side of the family. What is the problem that is being passed down through your mother's side of the family? <clears throat> you lived with it, you faced it. Now, one of the things I found out that was an alternative to hypnosis is using your intuition. So if you're willing 
You have all the answers inside you. You have everything recorded since conception. You have everything recorded from your ancestors, because it's all a part of you. You have everything recorded from your past lives. So if you were to know, how many generations did the problem begin on your mother's side of the family? And just see what pops in, just trust that. And now ask yourself, did it begin with a man, a woman, or both? Now, imagine that you were back there as a guiding spirit. You can invite anyone to help you. You can invite Buddha, Jesus, Moses, anybody that you feel close to and see the problem, you would have brought in a specific gift that would ameliorate that problem, that would help that problem. So that where, see, when water comes off a spring, if you put a boulder there, you know, it could go 50 miles away, 100 miles away where the water ends up. But if it's a clear stream, it'll just run down through you. Now, one part of forgiveness that I found is under every problem, the ego is hiding a gift that you have, actually a gift that you're frightened of. And in this case, you have a gift that would help your mother's ancestors and therefore help you and help your children and your grandchildren. So what's the gift you have? to share and to share that with them because every gift brings flow, it brings awareness, it brings connection. And now you can ask whoever came with you, who's this Jesus, Moses, whoever it was, to give their gift because they're all part of the healing aspect. You know, they're in oneness, they're in joy. So it's like what they have is like their joy that increases is to help us, their younger brothers and sisters. So let them help and let them help all your ancestors. What I learned so many years ago 50 years ago is that all pain is an illusion. And so all pain can be healed. And it's just a way of finding the way out. This is one way to free our ancestors. So you give that to your ancestors back there. And you let your older brother or sister bring those gifts, their gifts and your gifts down through that family, through your family. each generation. Forgiveness brings joy, healing brings wholeness and peace. So let it come down. You just witness, witness that connection with your older brother and sister, bringing it down to your family. And when it gets to your grandparents, notice the difference in your grandparents, what's happening now with your grandparents. That's different than what used to be. And now see it come down to your mother. See that peace, that freedom, that innocence that is true for all of us. And now see it coming down to you and, and your siblings and your nieces and nephews and possibly grandchildren. See that coming down to them. The very first client I had in 1971 they were dealing with ancestral problems.
before we go to your father's side of the family. Do you have time for a quick story? Okay, so it's 1975, and I'm um, not only working with the military doing rehab, I'm also training people. And I had one of the people who were learning to be counselors was a six foot six Marine. Now they don't typically let people in who are that tall in the Marines, but this guy was a, a six degree black belt. And he was very aware. And at the end of a Friday group, he came up to me and says, you gotta help me. And we had become pretty close in the time he was with me. He said, my wife is gonna divorce me this weekend. He said, what you were just talking about, about the ancestors. He said, I know this is the problem. He said, because, you know, all of us have been soldiers on my father's side of the family. And she doesn't want a soldier, she wants a husband. You know, the old saying about the Marines, you know, if we wanted to give you a wife, we would issue you one right at the beginning. So he says, can you help me? I said, sure. So I did this intuitive work. I said, I got 10, 10 minutes, I got another meeting I got to go to. I said, but it's enough. I said, if you were to know how many generations ago did it begin? He said, seven. I said, if you were to know if it was a man or a woman, he said, a man. He said, if you were to know where he was. And he said he was an officer in Valley Forge. And he said, they had no supplies, they had no ammunition, and they, they had no boots. There was blood in the snow for what was going on. And he had to be the strong one, the tough one, because he was the officer. And he said, that was passed down through my family. And then four generations after that, the father died. And the 12 year old boy had to take over supporting the whole family and it was a big family. And he got really strong and really tough. And he said, it continued on down through me. So we went back and we did a healing with him. One similar to this. I, I've learned maybe a dozen different ways of doing ancestral healing. This was one of the first. And he went back and Five minutes later, he said, I feel so free. Thank you so much. Monday morning, we came in. He's waiting for me at the top of the stairs. He lifts me up and he said, thank you. My wife fell back in love with me and we're continuing again on the next chapter. So anyhow, let's get back to your father's side. Okay. What's the problem passed down through your father's side of the family? You all know it, you live with it. You didn't know what to do with it. You've forgiven it, still there somehow. It's because it's layered. If you were to know how many generations ago it began, it was probably around. And who did it begin with? A man, a woman, or both? And what happened back in their generation? What was it? And as it was passed down through the family, how did it show up when it got to your grandparents? How did it show up when it got to your parent, your father? And how about you? And how about your children, if you have them? You may be still practicing. So now, Let's change that because that's heaven's will for us. Heaven's will for us is total happiness. So there's not meant to be any problem that can be stopped. So this time, imagine what that soul gift is inside you that is coming to free your father's side of the family. And open up that gift. In A Course in Miracles, it says you can take any gift you have and give it to God to increase it a thousand or even 10,000 times. So could you just imagine giving that gift to God who, who's part of your mind and let it be multiplied? 
and then to imagine energetically pouring that into your father. You know, your love for your father. You, you tried so many ways to help. You sacrificed yourself. You martyred yourself. You played all the different family roles, but they don't help. But your gifts make a difference. So you give this to your father and you let whoever is your helping companion. Buddha, Kuan Yin, Mother Mary, Mary Magdalene, Christ, let them help you. And let them take it from this gift you pour into your father and to pour up to your grandparents, from your father to his siblings, up to your grandparents, and let heaven take it up each generation until it gets to the original generation and brings this grace, this love that is yours, that is your love for your father and your father's family. Now, what I have found is that you can do this with your partner's family also. You can free them. This is, this is a simple one. This is an easy one. So, thank you. Thanks, Jeff. So, saying, I got uh, some information about the gross national happiness, the four pillars, nine domains of the areas that we looked for in the survey. And uh, I'll leave these books out there. You can see them if you want to get copies. And we got two or three projects going on. Uh, the uh, business, education, and the individuals, and one of these days we'll start our monthly meetings again. So it's wonderful to see everybody here. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, uh, and thank you as well, John, for sharing that. So we're going to close today's program with a, a pule, and this particular pule is one that we utilize within Unity Church. And it is the, uh, the prayer of protection. And in, in English, of course, it is uh, the light of God that surrounds us, the love of God enfolds us, the power of God protects us, the presence of God watches over us. Where we are, God is, and all is well. Um, so I'd like you all to stand up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to recite this in Hawaiian. And since we are going to go from that right into Hawaii Aloha, if we could just kind of circle around. That would be great. So if you are able to go ahead and circle up. I'm going to stay up here because I rewrote the words for, for the English part of the poem. Now, the one thing, whenever we circle up, there's, there's a purpose behind it, right? It is connection. It is to transfer our mana from one person to another. It is to remind ourselves of this, of the fact that we are not separate from one another. So I'd like you to turn your, your left hand up and your right hand down. So your left hand is receiving that mana, your right hand is giving that mana, that spiritual power, right, to one another. So this is the way that we we connect with each other. In Hawaiian, this prayer is Kamalo Mama O Kiakua E Okuni Mayoko, Kiao O Kiakua E Malama Mayoko, Kamana O Kiakua E Malama Mayoko, Makayoko E Kiakua E Kiakua No. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time together. We thank you so much for bringing us all here to, to remind us of the task at hand, to remind us that when we are clear, when we come to that understanding that forgiveness begins with us, forgiving ourselves, letting go of whatever pinkia is within us, then we can truly be of service to others. And I just ask you to allow this to be a continuation, allow this to be a beginning as well. We all need to revisit this place time and time again to remind ourselves of this connection to you, of this connection uh, to know that there is no separation from all of our ancestors who have come before to all of our progeny yet to come. There is no separation. And we thank you for this. We thank you for, for your manal, for your knowledge that you continuously pour into us. 
Give us strength as we continue this journey. Give us grace. Give us love. Give us aloha. These things we ask in your holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. So the English words that I kind of had to finagle a little bit uh, is, is this. So go ahead and play G. Oh, Hawaii, oh, stands of my birth. Sweet Hawaii, my native. So I'm now going to ask of all of you to sing with me in, in the Hawaii version, in the Hawaiian language, this song, and really understand the beauty of the lyrics of this song. Again, that we receive all of this from, from the divine, and yet we are all, when we sing in Eha Oli Na Opio, we are all children, we are all the youth of Hawaii, and not just of Hawaii, but the world. And so as you sing this song, really truly dive into, into the lyrics. So here we go. <laughs>
Before we, we really dismiss everyone, I want you to look around this room. Just look into the eyes of everyone who are here. As, as little as this hui is, as little as this group is, there's a lot of manna within this group. There's a lot of power within this group. There's a lot of, um, a lot of potential, a lot of responsibility, right? All within the eyes that you're looking in. And I'm asking you to connect, to really connect, to see each other for who we are and support each other, give each other strength, love each other. And that's what this gathering is truly all about. To forgive, to heal, to share our love with one another. Thank you all for being here today. It has certainly been a blessing for all of us uh, to hear the words spoken, to experience each other's company. And with that, our forgiveness program for this year now comes to an end. Please remember to fill out your evaluation form and see you next year at Hawaii International Forgiveness Day 2025. There are also light refreshments that are served behind, provided by, by the, our church family here. So please eat, stay, talk story a little bit, uh, and connect again. Mahalo, abuyo, aloha.